breaking the law to change the law so that animals could be freed. That was the belief of the Animal Liberation Front. PETA President Ingrid Newkirk tells the story about how the ALF changed animal rights in the U.S. in her book, Free the Animals, the amazing true story of the Animal Liberation Front in North America. That's next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights, brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, the modern history of animal rights in America, when regular folks took a moral stand to save animals tortured in laboratories, goes back to one woman who worked in D.C. law enforcement years ago. Valerie's story is told by Ingrid Newkirk, now president and co-founder of PETA. 30 years ago, Newkirk chronicled the courage of Valerie and other members of the Animal Liberation Front. And now her book has been reissued in an anniversary edition to mark a milestone in an American social justice movement. No longer considered so radical. Indeed, animal rights in recent years has become an issue that can bring politicos on the left and the right together in the name of compassion for animals. Here's my conversation with Ingrid Newkirk on the PETA podcast. This book, Free the Animals, the amazing true story of the Animal Liberation Front in North America, 30th anniversary edition. Ingrid Newkirk co-founder and president of PETA. Did you ever think you'd have a 30th anniversary edition? Well, I don't really actually think about time span, (laughs) Emil. I just get on with my work and what happens, happens. But it is good to come out with the 30th anniversary edition of Free the Animals for several reasons. One is experimentation hasn't gone away. And of course, you know, every day we are drawing people's attention to the fact it isn't just a few animals treated well in the search for a cure to disease. It's masses, millions of animals at billions of taxpayer dollars of taxpayer expense being used in every fool way and every fool thing and extremely cruelly. So I wanted it to come out. And I also wanted to update it to show what has changed, what hasn't changed, and what people today need to do to help us get animals out of the labs. And that's important to note. But once again, I'm just stuck by 30th anniversary edition and the history idea of going back to the time when there was still a very primitive sense of animal rights in America, a very primitive sense of what it means to care for other species and other, other beings. I mean, that's got to floor you a, a little, I mean, you've done a lot and we're going to get to that, but just the fact that back then 30 years ago, how primitive we were in, in these United States. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, when that, um, those raids with these brave people going into laboratories and bringing animals out, bringing videotapes and photographs out to show the public what was going on. When they first started, no one had a clue. No one had been inside a laboratory. And I remember when we had the very first raid, 1981, the Silver Spring Monkeys, and it was on the front page of the Washington Post, and we got bags and bags of mail from people who said, I had no idea that people with a science degree were doing that to animals when those of us just with plain common sense know that they're causing immense suffering. And so, yeah, things have changed, but the Animal Liberation Front is responsible for showing videos, showing it, films, showing photographs, and giving facts, which Peter was happy to cooperate with them to do. Yeah. So tell me a little bit before we get into the book, because it is a, a, a fascinating story. You tell the story of Valerie, who is a young police officer. But before we get, get into that, 
the idea of the animal liberation front, because some people, they might see it like they might have a notion of what it might be. What was the animal liberation front? Is it, does it still exist? Is it, it sounds kind of revolutionary in a way. What, what was it? What is the animal liberation front? Is it's not heaven forbid. It's not a band of revolutionaries or anything like that. Well, it actually is a band of revolutionaries, or it was. It started in the UK um, years before it came to the United States. And I think the title was very catchy because it gave you the idea that, uh, like the Palestine Liberation Front or the This, That and the Other Liberation Front, here animals finally had some brave people who were going to do something to break in and get them out of places where they were going to suffer and they were going to die or be killed, I should say. Um, But back then, I think it was a novel concept, and it came about, as I talk about in the book, with just ordinary people, as it usually is. I mean, look what's happening in Sri Lanka now, that people are rising up and kicking out the government. Um, It's like the Russian Revolution, which we probably need a new one of. But it's just ordinary people saying, enough is enough. I've now had my eyes open, and I need to get personally involved. And so these people risk their careers. They sometimes risk their family lives. They certainly risk their own freedom. They would have been locked up had they been caught. A few of them were caught. But they decided not going to sit back and just know this is happening to animals. I care about animals too deeply. To do that, I'm going to get involved. And that's what they did. But they had to do it clandestinely. They had to break the law. They had to do it because there was no protection otherwise for animals. This was a movement that began in in England, but did it when it came here? Were they were they Europeans? Or were they, or they or were Americans who saw what happened there? Take it to heart and say, "This is what we had to do here in the United States." In Europe, in the UK, it started with a few people who were going into factory farms. Factory farming was relatively new, and taking animals out. Um, I think the first thing might have been rabbits that were factory farmed for meat and fur, and then they were going to the Faroe Islands. And they were putting holes in boats that were used to go out and kill seals, the annual seal slaughter. And they were called the Band of Mercy. And then they thought they needed to be called something stronger that sounded more threatening. And I think they became the Animal Liberation Front. A few people who were working, perhaps in humane societies, um, had heard about this, had read some things about this. But when the Silver Spring Monkeys case came about, and as I say in the book, there was a time when these monkeys who had come out of a laboratory had been theoretically saved, were about to be sent right back to the same psychologist who had cut open their backs and was going to kill them. The people who had come to know them since their removal from that lab were the very people who said, this is what we need in America. We need an animal liberation front on our soil. And by gum, we're going to make one. And that's when they did. Was it pretty much a secret society or a coalition of people who had these feelings? And uh, I guess because it's clandestine, it's it's not really truly, as they say, organized. But what is your understanding about you know the tr- the true story of how they how they spread or how they did their thing? Well, as I talk about in the book, they actually were highly organized. I mean, we didn't have the internet back in 1981, and we didn't have cell phones or any of these sophisticated things. And so they worked out codes from payphone booths, from actually flying to meet each other or driving to meet each other. They had um, certain books they would use where they would pick out words and talk to each other. They had code names for raids and for how they would meet up. So they were very, very organized. They took enormous risks. Of course, the surveillance wasn't the same as it is now. The forensics weren't the same as they are now. So they had an easier time in that regard, but they were always at risk of being locked up. And so they had to be cautious. They had had to be deliberate. They had to be particular. Yeah, and yet this also poses the kind of moral dilemma. They saw what was going on. They opposed what was happening in the labs, and yet... 
they, as you said, a lot of the things they were doing were perhaps they had to break the law. When people heard about the ALF, the Animal Liberation Front, were they willing to join in and say, yes, you're right, go ahead? Or were they kind of stopped in their tracks from fully joining behind what the ALF believed in? Well, the ALF wasn't for everyone. That's absolutely uh, the case. Most people uh, don't have what it takes to break the law for a just cause. I mean, we look back at the women's movement, the suffragettes chaining themselves to the parliament rails, you know, people doing all sorts of things. The civil rights movement certainly is that people in the end, a certain contingent had to break the law in order to change the law or to change people's bad habits and prejudices. So it wasn't for everyone. And the Animal Liberation Front members and Peter would say, you know, if you criticize the ALF for breaking the law, it's really irrelevant. They're going to do what they're going to do. The question is, what are you doing legally to change things? You know, it's like the uh, the JFK thing. If, if you don't want a violent revolution, then, you know, change things peacefully. So it, it's all it's on us all. But no, not everyone could join because certainly at a particular point, you had people like the FBI and the ATF who were trying to infiltrate. They would go to animal rights meetings and pretend to care. And after all this was said and done, Peter had um, Freedom of Information Act requests that went in and were finally answered. And we found all the people agents going to our work parties, our volunteer uh, parties, our demonstrations, and trying to infiltrate. And so one had to be very careful, I'm sure, if you were in the ALF. Well, a lot of the what comes up is that they were trying, the FBI and that law enforcement was trying to pin or say ALF equals PETA, but that is not necessarily the case. I mean, that wasn't the situation or they, they couldn't find evidence to that, uh, that proved that. Well, when they couldn't find ALF members, which often they couldn't, sometimes they actually did. Uh, we were the most visible organization on the planet for animal rights. And we were no holds barred in what we thought about animal status, how it should be that they were viewed as individuals, not as some lesser human beings. And so of course, law enforcement came after us. And it was after 9-11 when um, law enforcement agencies had a very broad mandate and a lot of money to throw around, that they had 100% funding to look into Peter, uh, tap the phones, uh, come to the office and try to get security codes, all sorts of rubbish. But when it came to the ALF um, and there were subpoenas flying around, they were we were subpoenaed at PETA, but we weren't about to say anything we knew or to help anybody lock anybody up who was in the ALF. So, uh, but essentially there, there was never any kind of connection that said, well, ALF equals PETA and people, PETA, PETA, PETA equals ALF. There was a lot of harassment though, and a lot of intimidation that tried to thwart what PETA was trying to do legally. But as we see 30 years later, that really didn't uh, su succeed. They never succeeded. And I, I think one of the things was the University of Pennsylvania raid was very telling because um, there you had baboons having their heads bashed in and these devices, they'd be cemented into a helmet and then uh, crashed at a considerable G-force. The ALF went into that lab at UPenn took out hours and hours and hours of documentation videos shot by the experimenters themselves. And it showed them mocking the baboons, these brain damaged animals who were obviously in pain and deeply distressed, um, hurting them for fun, smoking and blowing smoke in their faces, you know, holding them up by one arm as a joke, all sorts of things. And instead of coming after the experimenters, once those videos were made public and they were on television, they were everywhere, the law enforcement went after the people who had brought those tapes out. And not being able to figure out who they were, um, the FBI served subpoenas on Peter or tried to. And in fact, I Emil, mean, it was kind of amusing. We try to have fun when we can, even in the most serious of times. 
is that everyone going in and out of the Peter office, which was then in Bethesda, Maryland, wore a monkey mask so that you wouldn't know who was who. But yeah, they harassed us a great deal, um, would sit outside our offices. We would go outside in winter and offer them hot chocolate uh, <laughs> and follow us everywhere. Take our handwriting samples, saliva samples, you name it. Um, but in the end, they should have been prosecuting the people in the lab. And in fact, a former Pennsylvania prosecutor met me at an event years later and said he was ashamed that they didn't do just that. You see, this is one of the things that we need to get out after 30 years in this 30th anniversary edition of this amazing true story. Free the Animals is the name of the book. The amazing true story of the Animal Liberation Front in North America. Because a lot of people have these misconceptions about what happened, what what the Animal Liberation Front is even all about. And what I like about your book is that you've really written a kind of thriller here. Because it's the true story of Valerie who is a young police officer in D.C., and she witnesses something, uh, horrible, horrible conditions in, that are happening to animals in a, a laboratory. Tell us about why you chose Valerie to, you know, to really personalize this story about the Animal Liberation Front. Well, her name had to be changed. And some other facts about her had to be changed, as it is true with all the characters in the book, but she's a real person. And everybody in the book is real. Every story of liberation, every animal who came out is real. All the facts are there. Nothing has been changed in that regard. Some precautions had to be taken because these people could still be locked up in some states where the felony statute of limitation has not run, believe it or not. Um, however, it, she's real. And what happened to her, that emotional moving experience that made her decide, I've crossed the line, which she did um, after being asked to help with that first removal of the monkeys to freedom, uh, I can't go back. And so she didn't go back and she kept on going, forming the Animal Liberation Front. But it's not just a factual story, as you say, it's an easy read because when I wrote it, I didn't want to make people just cry. I wanted people to feel rightly uplifted. I wanted them to cheer as little Vanguard, the little dog who is about to be deep sea dived in the Navy lab came out and was able to go to a wonderful home. And somebody put a you know, baseball cap on his head after three years in that home and showed him having a grand time and being loved. I wanted to show that animals got their freedom, animals that you love the same as the ones in your home. And so it's scary at times when these people almost get caught, as they often did. But it's also upsetting to hear what actually was going on to the animals. And then it is joyous to know they got away and things changed. Grants were suspended. Grants were cut off. Experiments ended. And all because the courage of this one Valerie, the young police officer, when she realized that she had to cross the line, how difficult was it for her? Well, in the book, I talk about her very real agony of um, knowing, you know, what should I do? What's right? What's wrong? She had always wanted to be in law enforcement. Her father had been in law enforcement I mean, this isn't exactly accurate in her personal details, but she had a strong moral drive and she had a desire to work on one side of the law to bring people to justice. Then she saw this gross injustice to the monkeys who came out of the Silver Spring lab. And to her, they were like children. They were helpless, only they were going to be operated on and killed and she had come to know them. And so she had to wrestle with her conscience. She went home, she spoke to her partner. And to his credit, he said, you know, you're a strong woman. You have your thoughts and your ethics, your moral beliefs. You decide, you have to decide. He didn't say, no, 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 no. You've got to stay in law enforcement. He said, make up your mind what's right in your, and we'll make you know you did the right thing. And she did. 
So she crossed the line, but it was very difficult for her. And I, there was no going back after that. She was leaving, leading a, a sort of double life and that didn't work. So she ended up resigning from that other position and full-time becoming an animal liberationist. Well, this is sort of the, the path that everyone who has to make a choice goes through. And yet, uh, you know, you go on to list all the other rescues that she did that probably every time she thought maybe I made the wrong decision, she makes a rescue and then it's a victory. Uh, animals freed. Uh, the animals are free. The animals. That's the name of the book. So tell us about some of her other rescues. Well, there are cats who are coming out of these labs. Howard University had a terrible laboratory and they almost got caught on that raid. But um, these cats were having their backs cut open. No good had ever come out of these experiments. And you know, Emil, why one thing people learn from the book is it's not just, if I may use the word just, the experiment itself. It's all the stress and the fear and the trauma and the total discomfort that these animals go through. I mean, you imagine if nothing was done to them, but they're kept in a see-through box, a cage, a metal thing that there's no comfort, there's no temperature control, there's nothing to lie on except the, the metal bars every day, every night. There's no companionship, there's no love, there's no respect, and there's a lot of fear because when the lab door opens, all these animals know that something bad is about to happen because that is what has always happened. They don't know why they're there, they're confused. I mean, it, it's a wretched life. So. The cats who came out of Howard, some of them couldn't walk. They'd had their backs operated on. All went um, away to veterinary care, just as the dogs from UC Harbor had the electrodes taken out of their bodies and they were restored to health. Wonderful veterinarians helped the ALF all the time. Without them, uh, they would have been sunk. And then, of course, there were the safe houses, the underground railroad for animals, that the cats went on to from Howard, the UC dogs went into and ended up having a different life. I don't know if they ever forgot their earlier experience, but they certainly knew they were safe and looked after. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you describe the Underground Railroad and the process by which animals are freed and then they're going to the safe house and then they find homes, it almost is a process that all these um, underground liberation kind of processes take place. I mean, you talk about people going to, to find, to escort people to say uh, abortions or, you know, legal abortions, or it's almost like this is a blueprint for all kind of liberation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, to me, it's all one thing. If you're against injustice, you're against discrimination, you're against needless violence, you're for all these causes. You can't differentiate. The victim's identity doesn't matter. Just don't give a hoot about the uh, victim's identity. It's the principle of the thing is you need to stick up for what's right, stick up for the underdog, who in the case of the Animal Liberation Front was often an actual dog. Um, and I always thought, you know, pe when people, to go back to your earlier point, people say, oh, well, they were breaking the law, is yes, it would be nice if there were a law that uh, they could have followed, which would have helped them expose these wrongdoings on the part of experimenters, but there wasn't. And if you have a cat you adore at home or a dog who you're spending your uh, family time with or whatever, and you have some empathy, then I think you have to take your hat off to these people because they were the ones who said, I'm not going to just sit quietly. I'm going to get these animals out. And they did. I mean, they, an enormous risk to themselves, took animals out of, like the little baby monkey britches, for example. His eyes were sewn shut. You know, another baby monkey had died in that lab of neglect. And they decided not going to let this happen anymore, went in and took him out, took him to the vet, had those horrible stitches removed from his eyes, found the infection in the back of his throat, and let him be a baby again. They actually kept him warm in little woolly baby clothes, fed him a bottle. And you see that in the films that have been made from Free the Animals, the book, and from the cases. They're on the website at peter.org. Yeah, there are so many cases. One that got me was the SEMA uh, lab 
where chimpanzees were held for experimentation and Valerie was there. What did she see there? That was an incredible case because it was such a secret laboratory. It was hidden away in an industrial complex. No one, not their neighbors, knew that it housed chimpanzees, lots of chimpanzees, kept in these big refrigerator-sized compartments. They couldn't see out. There was nothing whatsoever for them to touch or to do because these refrigerator-sized compartments were refrigerator-sized. They were the size of the chimpanzee plus maybe a few inches on either side. And all these chimpanzees could hear was this hum, this pump of air coming in and out of their chamber because it was filtered, because they, many of them, had been infected with hepatitis and with HIV. Not that chimpanzees ever get HIV, they do not, but it's all meaningless for human health. But anyway, there they were. It was a wonderful janitor who actually was afraid for the staff working there that they weren't being told the truth about the risk of infection, who managed to get word out. And the ALF picked up on this and worked with him And through his help, we're able to gain access to this hideous lab. And they were able to remove four baby chimpanzees who had just been flown in from an Air Force base where they'd been taken away from their loving mothers. And they wished them to freedom before they could be infected. And it caused this huge uproar because chimpanzees are worth a lot of money. You're not allowed anymore to experiment on them. And that was the beginning of it. That was the really breaking the species barrier to show people, look, this is what they're doing to these intelligent social relatives of yours, sticking them in these boxes for life, for decades. And so Jane Goodall got involved as a result of that raid. She said it was one of two of the worst experiences in her life to see how they were being kept. And as a result, gradually we chipped away and finally no chimpanzees can be used in experiments in the U.S. anymore. Well, and it started from a janitor, a janitor who was suspicious that something was going on, but he saw something and said something. He did. And I mean, you can always be indebted to whistleblowers. We have people, for example, who are a school bus driver and they're sitting up high and they go along a fence and they see that a cow has been left there in the field who has, uh, is unable to get up and the farmer doesn't care and they call us. We have people who go and sell things uh, to various facilities where animals are abused and who see something and make the call. And I've even had people who refused contracts in laboratories for air conditioning or for cleaning supplies or who knows what because they were ethically opposed to what they had seen. So we say whistleblowers are our best friend. Blow the whistle, no matter what cause it is. If you see something wrong, it's like the airport sign. See something, say something. Yeah, and I I suppose a lot of people don't know just how much they feel for the animals until they see something. They may not be challenged to say, oh my my God, you know, because they don't imagine or don't see it every day. But when you're describing the bus driver who sees something, it must have hit him and everything that people see, what Valerie saw, you know, touched her, moved her to action. And that is one of the things about Free the Animals, the book. Now, you, you had other cases. You had, you mentioned the University of Pennsylvania case and you mentioned the cemented helmets to the heads of baboons. I mean, that, the, the, what was the ultimate, it changed law, right? Congress got involved, uh, what was the outcome of that case in at the University of Pennsylvania? Well, the vivisectors, the people who had said, I hope the animal rights people don't get hold of these tapes. And of course they did. Peter got them. Uh, they didn't work. They, they, they got their grant suspended. They had to move on. Um, so all sorts of things happened as a result of it. Unfortunately, head injury experiments on animals continue to this day and are just as useless whether it's for football helmets or crash tests. We have mannequins, for God's sake. I mean, we have high-speed computers you can program with human data. You can crash robots into the wall and you'll know everything you need to know. But 
In many of these cases, the experimenter gave up using animals, which is good. In many of these cases, the grant funding was cut off. And in all these cases, the person involved who was doing the dirty work was exposed. And so his or her reputation suffered greatly, and that was only fair. But some of the experiments stopped forever, and many, many of them have continued in other forms to this day, which is why we need the research modernization deal, this plan that's being put together to phase out end animal experiments in favor of more modern methods has to be uh, adopted. And that's where everybody else comes in. Anyone listening, there's a role for you to play. Yeah. You know, we mentioned earlier the SEMA case that really ended the, the testing on chimpanzees. I mean, that that has got to be a significant landmark. I mean, to imagine that chimpanzees cannot be experimented on, but other species can, other animals can. Yeah, and that's one of the things that Peter says is just not right. It's not good enough. I mean, it's wonderful that no chimpanzees can be used because, by God, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them have been. And in fact, some of the very last ones to be used held in Alamogordo White Plains, New Mexico, are now being shifted to sanctuary in Florida. It's taken that long to move them out because it's no small matter to care for a chimpanzee. Um, but yeah, it's other animals are not good substitutes. The substitute that works is to use um, state of the art technology and methodologies. Uh, we have all manner of ways in which we can quickly get data that's relevant these days. And so force feeding an animal, sticking an electrode in their head, slamming them into a wall is really, it's just a waste of money as well as being cruel and it doesn't get us anywhere. So that research modernization deal that I mentioned doesn't say, you know, don't use chimpanzees, use pigs, or don't use dogs, use rats. It says all animals feel pain and fear and misery. All of them want out of the laboratories, and there's no excuse for keeping any of them in. A recent case that PETA has been involved in, it came out of an investigation that PETA did, the Invigo case involving the beagles. Now we have... 4,000 beagles that need homes, which is a good thing, but it was your, it was the PETA investigation that changed the law in Virginia. The undercover investigation got legislators, Virginia, you know, they, they argue about critical race theory. They, they're divided on everything, but the one thing they could agree on was dogs and cats. They shouldn't be using experiments and they passed those laws and they essentially not yet, but they essentially shut down in Vigo. Yeah, in Vigo will be shut down. And it, my heart sings because in Free the Animals, I talk about a similar situation with beagles, uh, lots and lots of beagles who came out of the, the city of hope. It, that's a misnomer if ever there was one when it comes to their use of animals. They used animals in every kind of cancer experiment under the sun, never got any results from using them. That money should have gone into treatments and prevention and all sorts of in superior methodologies. But yeah, it's so wonderful to think that those mother beagles with their babies who were being used because they could breed them and then ship their babies off, their puppies off and sell them into experimentation. The mothers and their puppies will never know what a scalpel is. They'll never know another cage as long as they live. And nobody will hose them down with cold water anymore and slam them up against the bars or make them smoke cigarettes or whatever they were going to do and then kill them. It's all over because of people rallied. And I always say, Emil, you know, conservative, liberal, in the middle, whatever you are, if you have ever met an animal and cared for that animal, no matter what kind, you have seen a reflection of yourself in that animal's eyes and you do not ever again think that you could condone causing needless suffering to them. Yeah, it's really incredible how uh, it has become, animal rights has become a kind of bipartisan issue that Democrats and Republicans can get together and pass no less than five laws in Virginia, which is essentially leading to the shutdown of Invigo. Let's hope the USDA still has to act. 
But now we have these 4,000 dogs who are now free and they're, they're up for adoption. All the other cases that Valerie and the ALF was involved in, have you ever followed up to see what happened to those animals after rescue? And have you ever heard what happened to their lives? Oh, yes. And in fact, um, in the book I talk about and in the video online, I talk about some of those special stories. There was an old bloodhound who was at the city of Hope. She was just on her last legs. She'd had a litter of puppies who were almost all dead. A couple of were, were still alive. And she was in such bad shape. She came out, the Animal Liberation Front rescued her with all the beagles and this wonderful old man dog called Prince, just angels. Anyway, years later, I actually got a letter and it's very moving. It was from people who said, whoever took, and they'd called her Goofy because her personality had eventually emerged after being so scared of everybody and everything. They said, whoever got Goofy to us, you know, please thank them. It's been many years, but she's just passed away and she enriched our lives so much. We were so happy to have her. And they described how she would run down a quarter mile country lane to greet her favorite person coming off the school bus or coming home from work every day. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, you, you hear stories like that. And were it not for the Animal Liberation Front, those animals would not have been there to share that joy or to experience that joy. Yeah, that little baby monkey I mentioned, Britches, who had his eyes sewn shut. We have after video of him too. And after he had recovered, and there was a recovery time, he had to be nurtured back to health. He went to um, a place where there was a mother monkey whose babies had been taken away from her. And he was given to her and you see the two of them. She is overcome with joy. She's making those little monkey tut 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 sounds and she's hugging him and he's looking up at her and they've got a background of bushes and flowers and so on in this giant uh, corn crib cage. And they are just happy as happy can be. See, in the end, it's a positive message. You rescue animals, they're able to live and be who they are, and they get to experience the same joy that we experience. They get to live their lives when you free the animals. It's true. And Emil, I would say, if you're not going to break into a lab, and these days that's pretty impossible, <laughs> support us in our legal work, please, to get animals out of the labs. And in your daily life, if you see somebody dragging their dog down the road, not letting them sniff the flowers and have a life, say something. Always say something because that helps free the animals from exploitation and domination. Yeah, it's it's really incredible. It, when, you know, we talk about your book, Free the Animals, the amazing true story of animal liber the Animal Liberation Front in North America, 30th anniversary edition. And I began by asking the question about 30 years later, it seems that Valerie knew the pattern of success all along. You, you witness the atrocities, you say something, you expose the atrocities, you get the laws to change, animals are saved. And that's the cycle that repeats or the pattern that repeats when you're successful. And fortunately, PETA has been very successful to this day. But I think if you don't do something you definitely will fail. What was it that that sportsman, I'm no sports person, said, is that you miss 100% of the balls you don't try to hit. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> if you if you fail at half of them, at least you have succeeded at half of them. Any, any success is a good success. Stumble along, do everything you can. Yes, and uh, I, I have to say that I, I like these things that show milestones, that show... Uh, where we are in time and how there is progress. And, but yet there's still so much more to go, right? We're, it's not over. A generation has passed and it's still not done. No, I mean, there's a long way to go. And it's not as if a few animals are used in one particular way and you can get cracking and stop it in a little time. It does require effort. It requires inconveniencing yourself sometimes. It requires using the voice you have, using your typing fingers. 
exposing others to what's happening because they just haven't a clue quite often. And certainly trying to educate young people, show the films, you know, read to them, talk to them, uh, show them the pictures, show them the options, because there's everything from vegan food to vegan clothing to cosmetics that aren't tested on animals and really get politically active. I think that is something most people don't want to do, but animals need them to be that active. Well, Ingrid, I appreciate you coming on uh, the PETA podcast and your support for the PETA podcast all these years. I uh, really appreciate it. And good luck on the book, Free the Animals, the amazing true story of the Animal Liberation Front in North America, 30th, 30th anniversary edition. I'm going to be a, a movie, maybe, because Joaquin Phoenix has bought the rights. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I want to play a part of a chimp. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Emil, as ever. All right. Thank you, Ingrid. Ingrid Newkirk, president and co-founder of PETA and the author of Free the Animals, the amazing true story of the Animal Liberation Front in North America, the special 30th anniversary edition available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of the show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at AMOK.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.